Hi. Hey. Hello, everyone. How's Thank you for joining us. So we only have 20 minutes, so I'm going to be uh, as expeditious as possible in this. So let's start out. Tell us about Ripple. What exactly is Ripple? How is it innovative in the financial services realm? And what attracted you to the, the project at first? Perfect. So uh, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Uh, you know, Ripple has a relatively bold vision of enabling an internet of value. And the, the fundamental idea is that we all take advantage of and benefit from, and I'm sure a lot of connected devices out there right now are benefiting from the internet of information. How can we let value move the way information moves today? You know, there's all kinds of crazy stories uh, about how there's friction in the payment process, ranging from, you know, I mean, one of my favorite examples is simply, it's just crazy to think about if you and I decide we want to get 10,000 pounds to London today, the most efficient thing for us to do in terms of speed would be to go buy an airplane ticket at SFO and fly it there. That's a pretty crazy statement in a world where you can stream video from the space station. You can't move your own money from point A to point B. So Ripple's vision is how do we take advantage of technologies of this today to dramatically accelerate the nature of how transactions and payments happen there's obviously a lot of excitement around blockchain, a lot of, frankly, I think a lot of hype around blockchain. Ripple's trying to focus on one specific use case, one set of customers around cross-border transactions, cross-border payments. Uh, we've been fortunate, I think, because of that focus, we now have over 100 customers using our technology. We've just started to introduce a product that uses a digital asset to fund liquidity, which we can talk more about. So. Uh, Anyway, we're really excited about the progress. We think that it is still the earliest innings of that evolution, uh, but it takes you know, a first step to start a marathon. So, so walk us through your ecosystem. Delineate the different pieces. There's, there's Ripple, there's XRP, yep. and then there's the Interledger protocol, correct? Correct. So how do those pieces fit together, and, and what do partners or, or customers of Ripple participate in that ecosystem? Yeah. How? It, it's a great question. I'll, I'll, I'll boil it down as simply as I can. So, Interledger protocol, I think about, and we call it ILP. Uh, and actually, I'll digress just by saying, I moved out to San Francisco in 1997 and was involved in some very, of the earliest companies involved in the internet. And I think about ILP, Interledger protocol, the same way I think about TCP IP. It's a fundamental open source technology that lots of things are built upon. Uh, in those days, you had a company called Cisco, and Cisco was building routers to connect your corporate network to TCP IP. In effect, what Ripple has done is said, hey, we're going to contribute an open source technology called ILP, and that's around interoperability between ledgers. Now, the, the, the kind of epiphany we have had is this idea that there's going to be one ledger to rule them all, we just fundamentally don't believe. And those that say, hey, everything is going to be on one ledger, maybe the Bitcoin blockchain, we just think that's not going to happen. Instead, we think about connecting ledgers in real time, interoperability between ledgers. So if Cisco is building routers to TCP IP, Ripple's technology is building routers and connections to ILP. So when we work with a bank, we go in and we sell a connection that allows the Bank of David and the Bank of Brad to settle in real time. That's actually a major step forward, but that's only using existing fiat. You're the Bank of David, your pounds will stick with that one, uh, and I'm, I'll be Mexican pesos. And I can now settle existing pools of liquidity between those two banks, and there, it doesn't touch crypto. That's product one for Ripple. What happens then, though, is we have the bank of audience. And the bank of audience, I don't have, I don't have any, uh, a bilateral relationship with them. There's too many of them. And I don't want to park liquidity. I don't want to park capital at all those different banks around the world. What if I can use a digital asset to fund real-time liquidity? So I no longer have to pre-fund. And what's amazing to think about is there's trillions and trillions of dormant capital sitting in these pre-funded accounts around the world that a bank has to put out. When I decide to work with you, I would put pounds at your bank and you would put pesos at my bank and then we'd use a better real-time settlement system. But wow, what if I didn't have to pre-fund those trillions of dollars around the world? Think about how much more efficient capital could be. So we think that's a, it's a, a major step forward. Uh, obviously, again, as I said, it's early days, but we've been very excited to have MoneyGram announced as a customer, Qualix, we announced two more customers earlier this week, uh, and so you know, making good progress. So when you're approaching get, bringing new customers into that ecosystem, what's the strategy for 
building that international, your international approach. We, you know, this is an East meets West conference here. Yep. You know, how does Ripple approach bringing your technology to the Asian market, for example? Well, so a couple of thoughts to that. We now have uh, seven offices around the world. Uh, we have an office with a joint venture in Tokyo. Uh, we have an office in Singapore, we have an office in Mumbai. Uh, so we, we, by nature of the work we do as a cross-border transactions, we work with banks around the world. We go to the local organizations and work with them locally. So we have offices around the world. We don't yet have an office in China. Uh, we certainly have looked at that. I, I think the likelihood is, and you know, I think many of us are aware that Many Silicon Valley companies have looked at how do we enter the market in China, and we have generally concluded doing that with a partner or with partners. And I think certainly as we think about that opportunity, I think we'll do the same. Uh, you know, I think it, for a whole bunch of reasons, there, that's a, a better path forward. Uh, but there's no doubt that in China and every other country, solving that cross-border friction is, is critical. Now, I'll also proactively say one of the things that has differentiated Ripple from you know, many in the ecosystem is we have taken the pro approach of we're going to work with governments, we're going to work with banks, we're not going to try to circumvent governments, we're not going to try to circumvent banks. And I think that has differentiated us. It has made us a bit contrarian in the early days. I think increasingly people have realized maybe that's a better strategy. Uh, I don't think governments are going to go away. But even as I think about uh, you know, markets, including China, we certainly would want to work with the PBOC. Uh, and uh, define how we enter because we only work with Ripple only works with regulated exchanges. We, you know, the Bank of England is a paid customer. The Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority is a paid customer of Ripple's. And you know, these are examples of how we're working with global regulators around the world. So XRP has seen some pretty explosive growth in the past year, you could say. Um, it's, it's a rapidly changing environment. You know, how does Ripple... Uh, uh, stay focused on what its core mission is? How does it differentiate what's important signals in the marketplace place versus what's just noise? It's a great question. And it, look, I think there has been more and more noise in the system. Uh, one of the things that, and actually as Dave and I were talking backstage, one of the comparisons I've made is it, the earliest days of the automobile, there was one size fits all. There was a Model T. And Henry Ford was somewhat famous for saying, you can have any color you want as long as it's black. You know, I think as you took the initial Model T and you fast forward, you end up with, you know, a pickup truck, a semi, a Maybach, a, you know, pick your car. And you, know, you had specialization of transportation or automobile. I think you're seeing the same thing happen with blockchain technology. And instead of, again, as I said, kind of one size fits all, you have block specific applications of blockchain focused on for Ripple, focused on payments. You see other players working in other verticals. And I think increasingly, you know, we won't talk about it as the blockchain industry. We'll talk about it as verticals taking advantage of a profound revolution in how transactions can happen. The earliest days of the internet when I moved here is all these internet companies. Well, now we don't really call them internet companies. We just call them companies. You know, they're, they're solving a problem for a real customer. And certainly this year has been a dramatic change in digital assets broadly. That's driven a lot of change at, at Ripple. But we've remained focused on our mission. How do we enable an internet of value? And I think what has not changed is that focus. And recognizing you have to solve a problem for a real customer. If you solve that problem, you solve it well, they're gonna to continue to use that and you can expand that and you can really enable this revolution from inside the system, not from outside. So let's, let's make this personal. How, how do you, Brad, when you wake up in the morning, how are you setting your priorities and, and your focus? Because I mean, you know, at our company, just in the past year, I might be worried about hiring an HR person to, I need to hire someone to lead the HR team to, Maybe we should just buy an HR company <laughs> to solve that problem for us. So how are you setting your priorities? Well, you know, I, at the end of the year, I sent out an all-company email, and I, I talked about, you know, hey, here's how I think about the priorities. And it, the reality is there wasn't anything dramatically different. When I, I think about, uh, while there's been massive changes in the market overall, the strategies and tactics and goals to move forward with an internet of value, to really make value move the way information moves today, it doesn't change just because the overall value went from 20 billion a year ago to 500 billion today. It still means you gotta 
get customers signed up. You have to get them integrated. You got to get them using your moving volume. Uh, and I think, you know, as you solve a real problem for a real customer, and if, if it's a faster product at a better price, people are going to use it. You know, there are people who, and there's articles that are written that say, hey, banks aren't going to use digital assets. Hey, I, I will tell you a quick story. Uh, about 20 years ago, I sat in the room with a gentleman named Randall Stevenson, who's now the CEO of AT&T. And I was the CEO of a, a VoIP company called Dialpad. And Randall Stevenson said to me, AT&T will never use IP for voice. And I thought at the time, okay, you know, that's fine. There's lots of kind of periphery things. We can solve, you know, phone you know, traffic from here to there. Look, AT&T's entire network now is IP. So when I hear banks say, we're not going to use digital assets, I, I, in my head, I, I see Randall Stevenson saying to me, at and never going to use IP. You know, a bank will use a product that helps them deliver a better product to their customer. If it reduces their cost and solves a real problem, I'm not worried about this. And the other thing is, if you have one bank, you know, if the bank of David says, hey, I'm not going to use this, but the, the bank of Brad decides I am going to use this, guess whose customers I'm going to go steal? The end customer, corporates, even individuals, they want a better solution. And if we can use these technologies to deliver a better solution, I don't have any concern that you know, over a longer arc of time uh, will achieve success. And when I say longer arc of time, I simply mean that at Ripple, we try very hard not to get distracted by what happens over a three-day or three-week period of time. I, I, we think about it as, hey, what are we doing over the next three years? What are we doing over the next 30 years? I view this as a fundamental revolution to how, how global commerce, reducing the friction in global commerce to truly unlock more value and make the entire eco, the financial ecosystem run much more smoothly. So there's... There's a lot of bright people in this room. There's a lot of great ideas floating around this space. I think one of the most impressive things about Ripple is not just the technology, but also the execution behind the technology that's gotten Ripple to the company is today. And there's very few other companies in the space that have been around so long that have gone through that maturity cycle. And uh, I had a great mentor tell me that you know, to, to build a company of any size, you really have to kill a company and, and rebirth it several times to get there. Yeah. So, you know, what do you think have been kind of the, the biggest wins for Ripple to kind of go through that maturity cycle to get it where it is now? And what do you see looking forward to 2018 as, as victories that you are looking to make? It's a great question. I think, you know, anytime you look back, uh, hindsight's always 2020. You don't necessarily know when it's happening that it's going to be as transformational. One of the things I would point to uh, for Ripple that was really transformational looking backwards uh, was some of the work we were doing in Japan. And we now have 61 banks in Japan alone using our technologies, wow. deploying both globally, across border, as well as domestically. And in particular, uh, one of the, the third largest bank in the world by assets is a bank called uh, MUFG. They're the parent company of Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi. We announced them as a customer uh, almost exactly one year ago, uh, you know, probably 11 months ago. And you know, from my point of view, it was one of many banks we had been talking to, and it was an important announcement. But I think, you know, when you have the third largest bank on the planet, which is generally viewed as a conservative, thoughtful, stick to your knitting, when you have them lean in and say, hey, look, we actually do think blockchain technologies are revolutionary, and we think it can help us be more successful as a bank, you see kind of a, a tipping point happen. And I think you saw that, uh, you, I think you certainly saw that for Ripple. It also, I think, uh, there have been a number of different people we've hired over a period of time, one of the former board members of Swift, a gentleman, Marcus Treacher, joined our team to run all of customer success. And, you know, th this was, you know, a, a former board member from Swift coming over and saying, hey, we, we don't think Swift's going to be necessarily a solution to really unlocking this internet of value. These are, you know, m marks along the journey. Now, as I look forward, uh, to me, it's all about what I said earlier, uh, solving real problems for real customers. Let's sign up more customers. Let's get them using more volume. Let's get them expanding from using one of our products to two of our products to three of our products. Uh, but again, I think that the, the mistake that people can make in the broad blockchain space is not being focused enough. There's a lot of science experiments out there. And you know, look, I, I loved going to college and <laughs> science experiments are cool. 
But that is not going to sustain, you know, you've got to have real utility. You've got to solve a real problem. And if you are doing those things, and if you have that product market fit, what we in Silicon Valley like to talk about, are the dogs eating the dog food, then it's going to be fine. And I think what we're seeing certainly is, you know, even relative to the products we launched in kind of Q3 last year, like the dogs are eating the dog food. The, the pipeline for customers is very robust. And, you know, I'm, I'm super excited how 2018 will, will unfold. I had never heard that statistic before on how many uh, Japanese banks you'll have. Where are the dogs eating the most dog food? Where do you think 2018 is going to be the, the most vibrant market and the most traction? Well, it's a good question. I, I think uh, the, the highest friction points are going to be where you're going to get the most dog food. I, we got to work on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the area where you're going to get the most engagement and velocity are the areas where today you have the most friction. Absolutely. And, you know, I, when we think about our priority customers, it isn't a Euro US problem, right? Or US dollar Euro problem. Now, on the other hand, uh, and, you know, another thing I mentioned to David backstage, uh, I was in talking to one of the largest global money center banks on the planet, and I was talking to them about our primary product, Fiat to Fiat, called X Current. And it, this guy kind of interrupts me. He's like, Yeah, 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 that's nice, but I have a problem settling into Peru. Can I use XRP to help me settle into Peru? And honestly, I was like, holy shit. Like, you know, here's one of the biggest <laughs> banks in the world who has more liquidity than almost anybody out there. And I'm not even trying to talk to him about crypto and digital assets. I'm trying to talk to him about the, the, the core of Fiat to Fiat. And, it, you know, he's already looking ahead and realizing that, look, th this is something that could help me solve a problem in Peru. And I don't want to necessarily hold currency in Peru from an inflation point of view, or a regulatory risk point of view, a compliance risk. So they're looking for other solutions. And again, if you solve a real problem for real customers, it's going to work out. Incredible. Well, everyone, we're out of time. Thank you uh, for joining us. Thank Brad for sharing his time. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, David. Thank you. Yeah.